So we're going to finish out our series today on schooled. And so we're going to look at, today we're going to be in the classroom. So what we've done so far is we've, we've kind of hung out in the locker room looking at temptation. We've hung out in the, in, the, um, in the lunchroom looking at friendships. And today we're going to hang out back in the um, classroom and we're going to talk about wisdom. I want to, let's pray, let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, and move us to a place where we can take the next step, and whatever that step may be for us, to go deeper in our walk with you and our love for neighbor. Lord, we pray that we will be sensitive to the leading of your spirit here in this place and at this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start out this morning reading to you from the book of Proverbs. So if you're, if you're not familiar with the Bible, the book of Proverbs kind of sits right in the middle of the book. And it's a part of what we call the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. And, um, and, and it also falls into the category of wisdom literature. Now, wisdom literature is, is not just strictly for um, the, the Hebrews weren't the only ones who had Hebrew or had he, um, wisdom literature. The Egyptians has a whole area of, of wisdom teaching. The, the, um, you know, the, the Persians had a whole group of wisdom. The Greeks had a whole group of wisdom writings. And, and so they're not, this is not exclusive to just the, the, the Jewish people. But it is some distinctive things that set them apart in their Hebrew writing and in, the, in their wisdom and that they, they give to others. And we'll talk about that. But the book of Proverbs, the majority of the Proverbs were written by King Solomon. Now, and, and, and that's going to be important because you, one of the questions you want to ask when you're studying the Bible is, okay, who is, this, who is the original audience? Like, who was this before it was given to us? Who was the original audience for this? Because for if you read the, the Proverbs, one of the things is at one moment they may be talking about relationships. The next moment they're talking about money. The next talk, they're talking about how to, how to govern in, in, a, in a government setting. So, I mean, they're, it's kind of all over the place on occasion. So, so one of the questions you want to ask is, who is this written for? Who is the, who is the, the, the original audience? And for the... For the book of Proverbs and the writings of the Proverbs, it was written majority by King Solomon. And, and so it was written in a context of royalty. That is, it was written to a particular demographic of people. And so in that particular demographic of people were people in power and people of influence. So it was people that, that would, would have the time to sit around and think about philosophical things. And so, because most of all, you know, if you're living mouth to mouth, like the majority of the, 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 the working folks were, you didn't have time to sit around and think about wisdom and take a, think about the role that wisdom played in your life. You just wanted to make sure your family was fed the next day and you were going to do whatever it took. So the book of Proverbs, the original audience was those, it was written by King Solomon, maybe to someone who was either going to inherit the kingdom, someone who was going to be in a place of power, in a place of influence. And so that, that's sort of the original audience that he, was, that he was writing to. And his purpose was, is to say, you know, as I look at the world and how the world works, these are certain these are certain guidelines or these are certain um, points of instruction that I want you to follow and, ob and, and obey with or, or God with. And so I want to start out with um, Proverbs chapter 8. I think this is a good place to start in describing what is wisdom. So verse 1, chapter 8 says, Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? In the Hebrew... The, the, the idea of wisdom comes with a feminine um, personality. And so, so, guys, that means that the, the wise person in your house is your wife. So I'm just saying, I, I didn't say that. This is in God's word. So, um, but I'm, I'm reminded of that often by my wife. So does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice and where, where does wisdom call and where does wisdom raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries out. To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. So wisdom is not something that's kept private. 
That is, you don't just sit around your dinner table at night giving wisdom to your children or sharing with wisdom is out on the streets. Wisdom is at the crossroads of government and philosophy. Wisdom is at the crossroads of government and religion. Wisdom is public. And that's where we find wisdom. It is in a social setting, it says. And then let's jump over to verse 22. The Lord created me at the beginning. That is, the Lord created wisdom at the beginning of his work. The first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight in rejoicing with him always. I rejoicing in his habited world and delighting in the human race. Here's what I want to say as we begin this time together about wisdom. Is that wisdom tells us that there is an order to the world. That there is a cause and effect that exists in our world. And so as the, as the wisdom writers, those who were putting this bit of wisdom together, stood back and they observed the world and they looked at how the world worked and how human beings function and relate to one another and how the, there are certain seasons of the year and there are certain cycles of life. And when, it, when all of that is being observed as a big picture, a sort of stand back big picture, the, the wisdom writer says, well, if that's happening on this level, then it must also happen on an individual level. That how you treat one another will ultimately have an effect on how you live your life. How you, how you, how you manage your household will have an effect on the outcome of your house. There was a certain rhythm that existed. And that's what the wisdom writers saw and what they, and, and what they saw. So, so as, as Christians, we're grateful for this wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs. But we also have to lay this book of Proverbs beside the gospel because what happens is Jesus comes as the word made flesh that is the one in which that we we know come to know who God is in Jesus Christ so ultimately perfect wisdom is wrapped up in the person of Jesus so if we fully want to understand what wisdom is that as a follower of Jesus we say well we've got to look to him to find the ultimate answer of when it comes to Jesus. And so here's what I want to do today. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about wisdom in the context of decision making. Because if there's one area that we need wisdom, that is in the area of when it comes to making decisions. Because some decisions, some decisions are easy to make. Like everybody knows, everyone knows that the University of Georgia has the best um, football program in the country, right? Or, or, okay, that was too much. So, or that the best cooked steak is medium well. That's some wise words, right? (laughs) I don't want my cow still moving when I'm eating it. Or, okra is best prepared when it is fried to a crisp. See, now you can tell we're in the south right there. And then there's some decisions that are more complicated. Like, where do I go to college? Or do I go to college? Who do I marry? Or should I get married? Should I apply for this job? Should I relocate? Should I turn in my resignation? Do I retire early? Do I invest in this startup? Some decisions are are a lot harder to make. Some decisions we make will lead us down a different path. But they're not necessarily life-shattering. That we make that decision and it it didn't turn out or it didn't work out the way it should. We can can still kind of navigate our way back 
on, on a direction that we were going to begin with. But there's some decisions that we will make that will challenge our worldview. Some decisions that require us to look at the world differently. And when we make that decision, it will affect how we look at the world and our place in the world from that point on in a different way altogether. Because here's the thing, there are basically, <clears throat> there are basically two types of decisions that you and I will make in life. You will make a task decision and you will make an identity decision. Now, task decisions consist of a function that must be performed. And most of our decision-making falls into this category. You know, for example, you made a decision to put on clothes this morning, which is a good thing. That was a task decision. Now, the type of clothes you decided to put on, that might be an identity decision. And some of you have got some really weird identities. I'm just kidding. But the decision to perform at work, that's a task decision. The decision to, to play ball with your son or your daughter in the front yard, that's a task decision. Most, most decisions, most task decisions are not necessarily going to be life-altering decisions. An identity decision is different. An identity decision is a membership decision. It's that is how we come to, to answer the question, who can be admitted, who is in, and who is out? We learn this very early on in our life when, when you're on the playground in elementary school, you know, and you're making, you're making alliances with one another, and you make a decision, can this little boy or this little girl be in our club or be in our group or not? Those are identity decisions, and it's identity that decisions that, that determines how we measure success and failure. So how you've come to define yourself, how you've come to understand yourself in the world, that will actually ultimately decide, define for you how you come to define what is success and what is failure in your, in your eyes. It's also where we draw the line. It's where we draw the line of who is in and who is out when it comes to defining family and friendships. Identity decisions can be life-altering. They force us to decide who we are and who others are in relation to ourselves. Identity decisions decide who can be admitted to my group or to my church or to my social club and under what conditions they can be admitted. If we claim to be people of faith, one of the most revealing places to test that claim is in the process of decision making. In other words, our faith is demonstrated in how we make decisions. So see, something happened. Here, here's, I want to give you an example. You and I, and this blows my mind. The more I think about it, just, it's just life-altering. You and I are here as a result of a life-changing decision that was made in Acts 15 and 16. Because if that decision would have went one other way, I mean, unless you are of a Jewish background, every one of us a Gentile, and because of that one decision that was made, we were given a place in this faith story. And I think as we begin to understand how the early church made decisions, we're going to be better equipped and how to make Christ-honoring decisions as a body of believers, but also as individuals and as a family. Here's the story. There was an officer in charge of 100 men of the Italian cohort, cohort of, of, the, of the Roman army. One day he got caught up in a vision, a vision from God, the Hebrew God, the Jehovah. He got caught up in a vision from Jehovah, and, and God told him in that vision that I'm going to send someone to you and to your household and they're going to tell you about me. They're going to tell you my story and how your story can intersect with my story. About noon the next day, Peter, a Jewish disciple of Jesus, was on the rooftop taking a nap. He got caught up in a vision. And in the vision, God showed Peter 
all sorts of unclean animals, which I don't have a clue how pork could be unclean. I'm just telling you, bacon is bacon. But all these these, all this unclean animals was, was showed to him uh, in this vision. And he told Peter, God told Peter, take and eat. And in response, what Peter says, and this is in Acts 10, 14, Peter says, by no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything profane or unclean. That is, God, I have never let, I ain't doing it. I am not doing it. I have never let anything unclean touch these lips, and I'm not about to start now. And the Lord responds in verse 15 of chapter 10, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. So Peter wakes up from the vision, and he's trying to understand, he's trying to make sense of this vision. And as he's sitting there processing it, As he's sitting there trying to figure out what is God up to? What is God doing? He hears a knock on his door. And there's three men that show up at his house. And they are from the home of Cornelius. The guy that God showed a day before. God showed in a vision the day before. I'm going to send you a man who will tell you my story. They show up at his house. Peter goes to the home of Cornelius. A Gentile, a Jew walking into the home of a Gentile, which is a no-no. And and Cornelius begins to explain to Peter his vision. And then Peter turns and he begins to tell Cornelius the story of God and how God came to rescue the world through this person of Jesus Christ and how all of God's children, at that point Peter thought meant Hebrews, was going to be a part of this kingdom movement. But before Peter could even finish the story, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, that the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. Cornelius, this Gentile, and his entire household had been baptized. Now, Today, we got text, you know, we can text somebody, you know, when, when as soon as you hear something, a news about somebody, you can get that news out just like that. It's remarkable to me when you're reading the story in Acts, how quickly word gets back to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. They're all hanging out, trying to figure out how they're going to manage this new movement of God and, and what that's going to look like. Well, word gets back to them that Peter that this, Peter's just had this experience. So they, they call for Peter to come and explain himself. And they, this, is the, this is what they asked him. They wanted to know, Peter, why? And this is in Acts 11, 11, 13. Why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? You're a Jew. You don't do that. Not only did you just walk into a Gentile house, you sat down at his table. And you had a BLT. (laughs) Peter says in verse 12, the Spirit told me to go with them. The Spirit told me not to make a distinction between them and us. And then I can see him kind of pushing back from the table and he says this in verse chapter 11, verse 17 of Acts. He said, let me ask you something, fellas. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I would hinder God? And that's the question, isn't it? And, and so, so before long, more Gentile Christians became a part of the church than Jewish background Christians. Now, that's going to create a problem. And so this will be a challenge to Jewish background believers. Because anyone, any of us, anyone who is forced to make an identity decision that requires a change in your worldview, well, that's difficult. And so many of these Jewish 
these Jewish Christians that, that thought this influx, so their thinking was that this influx of Gentiles, that's you and me, coming into the church, that we're going to somehow, we're going to weaken the church's moral standards. So we've got to understand, we've got to start setting some rules. We've got to start lining out some responsibilities. We've got to start saying, we've got to, we've got to start putting up some boundaries. But it's not just that. The Jewish Christians also saw, and this is where their worldview gets rocked, they saw themselves as a remnant of Israel. They saw themselves as the embodiment of their ancestral hope and promise that God said to Abraham, I will, I will make among you a people. And so these early Jewish Christians, the ones who had received and accepted Jesus as the Messiah, that was wrapped up into their identity. They went back and they read their entire story, the Old Testament. They went back and read it through the lens of Jesus. And now if they was going to accept this, that God would actually bring Gentiles into this movement, that means they're going to have to go back again and now read their entire worldview through another lens. I want you to get the, the impact of this. Our faith is demonstrated in how we make decisions. So now the church is forced to make a decision. And I think it's just crazy. It just blows my mind to think about that, that the very existence of the faith and how it would be passed down hinged on that first Christian meeting. All of us in this room, Jew or Gentile background, and we're here because of the decision that was made in Acts 15 and 16. We get to be a part of the Christian story because of that decision. We have a particular faith that we get to pass down to our children and our grandchildren, all because of what happened in that one room in that decision process. So after hearing the testimony of what God was doing in the Gentile world and how God was shaking things up in the Gentile world and how there was this mighty move of, of conversions happening in the Gentile world. The church leaders decided in Acts 15 verse 19 says that we will not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. What it means, it, it basically means that they don't need to become Jewish before they become Christian. But it also means that the church was going to be open to all who experienced the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is what I want us to hold on to. And, and this is where I think the, the modern church can shift its thinking in how we do church. And here's the truth. Here's the thing. That the council, that first council, they didn't meet... <clears throat> That first council did not meet in order to decide what God had the right to do. Because God had the right to do whatever God wants to do. God can touch whoever God wants to touch. God can convert whoever God wants to convert. God can shake up anybody's worldview that God chooses to shake up. They didn't meet to decide what God had the right to do in their midst. We don't have a right to do that, church. Their role was rather to discern what God was doing and how they might could live in that new reality. Their role was to, was to step back and to pray and discern how is God moving among people today and how do we get to be a part of that movement? And that is where we need to bring and put church leadership today is that we need to spend time on our knees and discerning where is God moving in our world today and how can we as a church body be a part of that movement and participate in that movement. As God acts among us, it's our job to pray and to discern what God is doing and to determine how we will live obediently to the movement of the Spirit. <clears throat> I think 
I think what we need today is, is not more knowledge. We got some really smart people. We need wisdom. Before we answer the question about what we think about certain decisions, I think, I know this sounds rude, but I think we just, we gotta, we gotta learn how to think again. I mean, we, we need to learn how to think critically. One of, the, one of the things I love about the Methodist church is, is when I was, when, you know, I didn't grow up in church. And so, and so I, you know, I'm saved by the grace of God and then this opportunity to experience God's movement in, in different communities. And I was drawn to the Methodist church, not just because of a grandfather who was in this, but also because it was in the Methodist church that I've learned to think and to think critically. And I wasn't told that I had to, you know, take my brain out before I came into the church. But I was, I was challenged. And, and so, and, and that's one thing I think is, I mean, think about it. The whole movement, the whole Methodist movement started on the campus of Oxford University in England. You know, the, the, the genius of the Methodist movement is that it, can, it connects the heart to the mind. And, and I think we got to go back to that. We need to get back to that place where we can, we can, you know, we can come together and we not agree on everything. We may disagree on some things and we may disagree on certain things. But at the end of the day, we're going to sit down together and we're going to discern God's movement in the world and how we can join together and be a part of that movement. I think we've lost our ability to think critically. We let a lot of, we let a lot of people do thinking for us. You know, one of my favorite questions is simply why. When my children come home from school and they have a, they have a certain way that they've started to think about something because they've been influenced by a friend or even an educator or, or whatever, I wanna, one of my questions to them is why. You know, when, in, when, why have you been led to think about that in a certain way, both positive and negative? Because I want them to move beyond just the task decision of that, of that moment to really getting to the heart of the matter. And that's where why comes from. You know, when, when someone comes to me and they, they tell me they, that they think that they are right and everyone else is wrong, I want to ask why. Is it because someone else has told you that? Or is it because you've spent time in prayer and discernment with God? Why? And I think that's, to me, that was one of the things that... that Politics aside, that's one thing that, that, that uh, John McCain left behind. Was like, let's just sit right here in the middle and let's think and let's just ask the question why. For good or bad or whatever, but I, I think there's some power in that. Because here's task decisions are going to be shaped by our identity decisions. So here's, here's my definition of wisdom. I, actually, I'll give you a couple. But wisdom is making task decisions based off the answer to the identity decision. It's not jumping quickly to that task decision, but sitting with who am I going to be? What kind of person am I going to be? So before I ask, what do I want to do? You know, we, we have kids, you know, graduating from college. And one of the first things, you know, as parents we want to do is like, okay, I've just spent a whole bunch of money on you. What are you going to do with your life now? I think we're jumping ahead in that question. I think what we need to be asking is, is, who is the, who, what kind of human being do you want to become? What kind of person do you want to be? You know, we, we, we say, you know, we, and, and here, here's the other thing that I, that I, have you noticed that Christians are the only ones who are pushing for the Ten Commandments to be put in public places? If you notice that we're the only ones that are insisting that it be put in the courthouses. And, but, but the Ten Commandments first belong to the Jewish people and not to us. But have you ever heard of a Jewish person um, pushing for those Ten Commandments to be put up on a wall? No. Why? Because they have been shaped by their identity. And they're asking the identity question first. And I think that's what we, we do a disservice to our kids when we go through the Ten Commandments. a perfect example. Don't kill. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't go over there and steal my neighbor's donkey. Whatever. If we can't articulate why they don't need to do that, then we're not ready to put them up. And I think we got to get back to that. What type of person are you, do you want to become? So wisdom, here's my simple definition of wisdom. Wisdom is speaking to the identity before demanding the particular task. 
The book of Proverbs and all of the wisdom writing in Scripture only makes sense when we read it from that perspective. Because that identity question, well, that identity question had already been answered by the, by the readers and the listeners, the hearers of the, of the Proverbs. They knew what God had called them to do. They knew who God had called them to be. They were slaves in Egypt, set apart as God's people, made promises to them that if they, if they lived by that, then they would be a blessing not among themselves but also to the world. And that's the lens in which the, the listeners would hear the book of Proverbs. So as people called out by God, how do we raise our children? How do we handle our money? How do we serve in leadership? How do we deal with relationships? How do, we, how do we eat and drink wisely? The author of Proverbs was writing from a perspective that if we are the people of God, then this is how you conduct your life. So if you're a student, what kind of student are you becoming? This is not about your grades. It's not about in, it, your performance. But as a, as a student of character, who are you wanting to be known for? If you're an athlete, what type of athlete are you becoming? Not just if, if you know, what you're going to increase your batting average or, or, or your tackles, but what kind of person are you becoming on that field? If you're a wife or you're a, you're a, you're a mother or if you're a husband or, or whatever, if, if, what kind of spouse, what kind of parent are you becoming? So before you go and answer the question of, of what you want to do with your life, let's ask the question, who do I want to become? And that is the beginning of wisdom. Now give me five more minutes. I promise I'll leave you. I promise. So I want to say this, though, and I think this is important. There's a popular celebrity preacher, which is an oxymoron, but there's a popular preacher who made this question famous. What is the wise thing to do? We've got some Sunday school classes who've actually used that curriculum in, the, in here. I think that's a good question. If you want to be a good Christian, if, if all you're aiming for is to be a good person, then that's a fair question. But Jesus calls us to more. Jesus calls us to love our neighbor. Anybody in here have a perfect neighbor? Don't raise your hand because you might be sitting beside him or something. I don't know. But nobody has that perfect neighbor. But he calls us to love and he calls us to pray for our enemies. To make sacrifices that go beyond the self. To love one another through radical, selfless commitment. So the question, what is the wise thing to do? I think that falls short of the call of discipleship. Because let me, let me just be really, really honest. Sometimes what Jesus calls of us by world standards doesn't seem wise. To pray for my enemy when I really want them to go to hell, that just doesn't seem wise. To love a neighbor who is almost unlovable, that's not wise. Or as Jesus said to the, to the rich young ruler, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. There's some financial planners in here who would go crazy if that happened. Jesus summarized the entire Jewish law by saying this, he said, you can, you can sum it up by loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on and he says, all the laws and the prophets, which include the wisdom writings, hang on these two commandments. As you go about making decisions, on who to love or who not to love, on who to marry, on where to work or how you're going to spend your money or who you're going to vote for. The thing that should be on the top of your mind as a follower of Christ is not what is the wise thing to do, but does this decision witness to my love of God and my love of neighbor? Does this decision witness to my love of God and my love of neighbor? Because as Christians, we make decisions for the greater good of God's kingdom. We are a part of a social movement 
called the kingdom of God. So will this decision demonstrate my love for God and my love for neighbor? If we claim to be people of faith, one of the most revealing places that that claim is lived out in our, is in our decision making. In other words, our faith is demonstrated in how we make decisions. Showing wisdom in decision making happens when we start with the identity question before we get to the task question. So I wanna, we're going to invite, I think the band's going to come on up. And, and so we're going to go a little bit longer. I'm sorry, if you got to go, then go. So, but I, want, I know some of you are in the midst of making some really important decisions in your life. And so we want to give you a time right now to really just center yourself in the Holy Spirit because I believe that God wants to give you wisdom. The book of James tells us that the gift, that wisdom is a gift that God longs to give to his children. And I believe that God wants to give you wisdom in that decision today. And so as we close in this final song, this is a time for you to just sit in that moment and ask that question, does the, how I'm about to make this decision, does it reflect my love of God? And my love of neighbor. That's the question I want us to ask as we begin, as we move forward. And then when you ask that question and you know the answer to that question, and then you go out and you figure out how to accomplish what it is. And God will empower you because you'll be living that that decision in the will of God. And that's my hope for all of us today. God bless you.